Good morning. It is still morning, just barely. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I want to welcome everyone who is here today, our members, our visitors. If you are a visitor, take note. We do have a visitor's potluck after church, and it will be delicious. Just follow your noses that direction. It's in our fellowship hall. You are more than welcome. We're so happy you're here. Welcome internet viewers as well. I have a couple of awesome announcements. Um, This evening, we are having a picnic at Percy Warner Park. It is an Imagine Nashville picnic. So all of the SDA area churches are all gonna be there. We're all gonna fellowship together. Um, It'll be great. It's at 6 p.m. And it is in shelter number four in the Indian Springs section of Percy Warner Park. If you need more directions than than that, just look in your newsletter. So please, everyone come to that. It's going to be great. We're going to have a little bit of music, a little bit of a Vespers to close the Sabbath, and a whole lot of fellowship and food. Uh, We also have another event coming up, which is the Imagine You Healthy Lifestyle Expo. This will be on July 21st, and we need volunteers for that. This is an amazing outreach opportunity. It's happening after our block party and before our evangelistic outreach. So this is a fantastic way for you to be involved in reaching our community in a very real way way. So we have um, these flyers that if you're interested, you can pick them up. It has information on how you can volunteer and be a part of it. Or if you just need to come and you know people who need to be involved in this, um, the deacons will have that at the end of the service that you can pick up on the way out. Um, Tomorrow in the fellowship hall, June 30 from 3 to 5 p.m., we will be having a memorial service for Sonny Coker, who is Danny Coker's brother who passed away. Um, The service will begin at 4 p.m. And lastly, we do have a baby dedication today. Baby Carmen is being dedicated, and we have Pastor Byron, who's a former pastor of this church, who's here to dedicate Carmen today. So I'm going to turn things over to him right now. this song, I'd like to invite the Gramada family to come and join me here and my family on the platform. For this child, I have prayed, and you heard my cry. For this baby, I had I vow to you this day I dedicate this baby back to you I dedicate myself to train and love You know, it's so good to be back here with this wonderful church family and these great people. And Daniel and Christine, can you believe that today is 35 months 
to the exact weekend from when we dedicated Titus. And we're here to join you for that. That's hard to believe how much time has gone by. And it's good to see the family, the Comans and the Gergescus and the rest and the brother, Olivia, and uh, yeah, Mitch and Liz. And wow, it's just wonderful to have. And you're growing up so much. Wow. What a moment. What a moment. You know, at the time when we dedicated Titus, it was such a miracle, wasn't it? And, and we were celebrating that. And, and I don't think any of us were thinking, even remotely, about another child. We were just thrilled at the goodness of God that, that you had uh, Titus. And, and here we are today rejoicing over Carmen. And how fitting an evidence it is of God's goodness and his mercy to his faithful children. You know, Daniel, you had your son but God's like, ah, this ain't quite fair. I'm not quite done here. He knew that Titus needed a sibling and he knew that Christine needed a daughter. And, and so he just opened the windows of heaven and he lavished Carmen upon you. That's not to say that the, the second pregnancy was a walk in the park. You know, I remember getting the news and how exciting it was when you text us, ah, we're pregnant again, you know, and and then there, but there were some scary moments along the way because a number of weeks after that excitement of uh, having, uh, having this little baby growing, growing there inside the womb, there came a moment when things weren't going so well and, and the complications were there and we got that urgent text and the tears and the things that were happening and we, you'd been to see the doctor several times and we joined you in prayer as I'm sure many others did and, and we just lifted that up to the Lord and, and I remember when things got the worst and, and, and you, you, Daniel you gathered your family you guys got down on your knees and you prayed and you just pled wrestled with God and you got a deep peace that God was bigger than all the problems and even than all the doctors and you know after that prayer you got up from that prayer the complications stopped and they went away and things went back to normal and then the pregnancy continued. And then, of course, as you got to the end, things got a little complicated again. And we had to have this little bundle of joy come several weeks early, which was a little bit scary in itself, too. And those first couple weeks were, were pretty rough. And she was in NICU, and you were a little bit of a mess. And, and, and God brought you and Carmen through that. And he spoke to your heart in those moments and said, don't give up. Keep fighting. It's going to be OK here we are today and everything is okay and I know your heart's prayer is God whatever needs to happen because she came too early make it happen keep that going right and uh, Carmen is so different than Titus and you know what Danny you got to watch out brother I know you're you're a weak man for this little girl and so <laughs> I'm already praying for you I'm already praying for you big time but there's something about a little girl to touch a daddy's heart, isn't there? I, I, I've had that experience three times, and uh, it's a blessing. It's, it's a blessing. How when you come into the room, her face lights up, and, and she smiles. You wonder, does she really know me? But you know, you know she knows who you are in that special way. And yeah, you're going to have to watch out that you don't spoil her, and, and you're, you're going to have to help him be strong, Christine, okay? I'm a little worried about both of you. I really am. But, uh, you know, you just come, come walk with the Lord um, so that he can just guide you and give you that wisdom so that you can give her the kind of kind but firm discipline and guidance so that the beauty in her character is what develops and not the selfishness. Because every one of us is born with, with potential, good potential and bad potential. And every one of us is born with an unselfish part of us, but there's a selfish part of us. And, and it's going to be up to you as parents to help the godly part and the beautiful, unselfish part develop and, and to, to help the unselfish not develop. And so I'm praying that God is going to give you that wisdom and that grace. I know your hearts today here are to praise God for Carmen and recognize that she is absolutely his blessing to you and that you're really just stewards of her life. Your heart's desire is for her to know God and to know her place in his plan and to live her life in a way to bring him honor and glory. And I loved one thing you said to me, Danny, as we were talking, that you don't care if the whole world forgets her name or your names. 
just that God knows her name and that she knows God's name and that he knows your names. And I know that through this experience, Psalm 139 has become very precious to you where it says, for it was you who formed my inward parts and you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And isn't she a wonderful work of God? Yes, she is. And I know that very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. Wonderful are your thoughts to me. They are too high for me to comprehend. And I know that's become so special to you. And so you are here today, not only to praise God for the gift of Carmen, but also to give her back to him in dedication. And so I want to give you an opportunity to respond to three vows. First of all, Daniel and Christine, do you recognize your daughter, Carmen Sylvia Gramada, as a gift from God? And do you thank him for this blessing and ask for divine wisdom to be faithful to this trust? Do you, Daniel Christine, wish to present Carmen to the Lord in dedication, asking his hand of blessing and protection to be over her and giving the Lord special permission in her life from this day forward? Yes. Amen. And do you, Daniel Christine, promise to do everything in your power to raise Christine with the help of your extended family and church family? in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, protecting her from evil influences, giving her every advantage of home and school and church so that she may one day choose Jesus for herself and fulfill the high calling that he has for her life. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, let me take Carmen in my arms and present her to the Lord. Hang on. Okay. Look at you, look at you. She likes me too. <laughs> All right. I want to pray a special prayer for her and for you right now, but I'd like to include as we wrap up this Sabbath, uh, this quarter's lessons on the family, I'd like to include all the rest of the families and children in the congregation in that prayer as well. Let's, let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, how we rejoice with this wonderful family with Daniel and Christine and Titus and Carmen and their extended family who's here with them today. Lord, we praise you for this gift of your creation and, and your love in their life and the miracle of, of Carmen. Heavenly Father, as they present her to you in dedication, we pray that you will bless her in a very special way. We pray that your hand will be upon her from this day forward, that you will guide and protect her and just uh, bless her to become the woman that you created her to be. Heavenly Father, give Daniel and Christine the, the wisdom they need as, as to be her parents and to guide her in a godly way. Give them strength for those moments when they're not sure how best to handle the situation. Help them to have the right blend of love and mercy and yet justice and discipline in their home Amen. so that she will be a godly woman. And Heavenly Father, I want to also pray for all the families here in this church and their children. May they all grow in godliness. And as scripture says of Jesus, that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. May that be everyone's testimony and experience here. And in a special way for the Gramadas today, I pray and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Pastor Ken has a rose for you, Christine, and your certificate of dedication that we'd like to present to you just at this time right now. We love you guys. We love you guys so much. Danny, come here. We love you. You have granted such a trust with this precious gift. With your power, by your love, my all I commit. On this 
church family. Amen. Isn't it such an amazing thing to see a child dedicated in the house of God? Amen. Please join me in singing Mighty to Sing. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nation. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and fill. Again, I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender, I surrender, Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to say. Mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing. 
for the glory of the risen King Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave And now it's time, children's time, so if you're a child and you would like to help with um, relieving the adults of some money so that we can help the children's ministries, then now is the time to do it. Children, come up for children's story. Hi, ladies and gents. My name is Alex. And first, before we do anything, I'm going to tell you two things. And they're very important for the rest of the time that we have here, okay? First thing is, in sign language, how you say the word yes is to act like you're knocking on a door. Can everybody do that? Knock? Yes? All right. So the other thing I'm going to teach you is the word no. So no is a little trickier. You put two fingers up, and you put your thumb down, and you pinch together once. No. Everybody got that? All right, so, have any of you guys been tempted before? Yeah, maybe? What kind of, what is temptation? What does it mean to be tempted? Does anybody know? Tell me, no. It's okay, yeah? Or is to do something but it's really hard not to do? Maybe, yeah, it's something that is hard not to do. So maybe it's something that you want to do, but you know it's not good for you. Yeah? So, what kind of temptations are there? What is, what is uh, an example? Are you tempted sometimes to disobey mom and dad? Because you want to do something and they said no? Are you tempted to sometimes eat something that you were told you're not supposed to eat? Or go somewhere you're not supposed to go? I was definitely one of those kinds of people. So, when I was a lot shorter, a lot shorter, I moved to a different church. And I, <laughs> I decided, between Sabbath school and church service, to go exploring without mom and dad, which I know I was not supposed to do in the first place. So I was tempted to go exploring, and I found this door that was just a little bit open, and I knew I probably shouldn't go over there because it said staff only. But I went inside anyway. And so temptation number one, I failed. Temptation number two, I climbed up some stairs 
because I wanted to see where they, where they would go to. And as I walked up the stairs, walk, 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 I got to the top of the stairs, and I found out that it was the baptistry. And I found out it was the baptistry because I kept walking, and I fell into the baptistry. So, uh, I said yes to temptation, and I got in big trouble, because everybody knew about it. Imagine being all the way up there. Everybody look behind you, see that? And everybody out here saw me fall into the bathtub. <laughs> so, um, I learned that it was not a good idea to give in to my temptations. But I was not very good at saying no to my temptations, because sometimes you want to do something, you want to go exploring, or you want to go eat something that your mom and dad said not to, or you don't want to do something that you should. And Jesus said to his disciples, when you have a hard time with, with being tempted, then you should pray. He told his disciples, pray that you do not fall into temptation. Because we are not strong enough to say no by ourselves, right? So whenever you guys know you shouldn't do something, and you really want to do it, you tell God, you pray, Jesus, give me the strength to say no because I want to do what you want me to do. Can we do that? All right, let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this Sabbath and the time that we get to spend together learning about you. And we ask that you give us strength in the times that we want to say yes to temptation, to say no, and to give the glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats. Good morning. If the deacons could please come forward for the offering, I would appreciate it. Today's offering is for small school enrichment. What is small school enrichment? Well, it's for our Kentucky, Tennessee schools that are a little smaller and need a little more help. So to me, this is about Adventist education, and if you want me to stand up and give a sermon, ask me about Adventist education. For first service, I shared how many years that I have been in advanced education. Pastor Chelsea uh, audibly gasped. It was true. Um, but the other side of that is I've had three children that have been through advanced education. Um, made a choice not, that I was not proud of, that they pulled them out for a little while. By the Lord's grace, they were back in. And I thank the Lord every day for their education that they got when they were in the Adventist system. So we here at Madison are very blessed when it comes to education, Adventist education. So this is the time that we can help other schools as well. So I ask that as you are thinking about what you're going to give for offering today, that you pull out a little bit more and just give a little bit more because Adventist education is important. Let's pray. Good morning, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for this church family. Uh, you are an amazing God. I ask that you help us as we start to pull that money out of our wallets and help your education system and the information that your students and your kids receive. Lord, we are blessed. You bless us. I ask that you help us bless others. Lord, you're an amazing God. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask that you come soon. In Jesus' name, amen.
This past week, I made the mistake of saying yes when my coworker asked me if I wanted to go running after work. It was Tuesday afternoon and, and 83 and 87, somewhere around there, 20 degrees too hot for me to go and sweat in the afternoon sun. But we did a two and, I say we, he did a two and three quarter mile loop. I did a two and a quarter mile walk slash run. But we got back to the car, it was after work, he was already stretching and I started stretching and loosening up, sweating buckets and buckets of sweat and he goes, hey, are you, uh, are you going to be going to the manager training, the mandatory manager training we're having in September? And I said, oh no, um, I'm planning on going, I'll be there for Friday, but I'm going to miss the Saturday portion. He goes, oh, why's that? Oh, well, I, I choose to uh, not work. 24 hours, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. That's my Sabbath. That's when I take all my worries, my stresses, I set them aside, and I focus on the peace and rest that God gives me. Oh, okay, that's cool. And then we went our separate ways. But I was thinking about that later on in the week, about that rest that we get one day a week where we don't focus on all the worries and stresses that we have. And I love Sabbath. How many of you love Sabbath and the fact that you don't have to worry about your work and your stress? But I was thinking a little bit more, Sunday through Friday, that stress is still there. You still have the concerns about work. You still have all those things that are keeping you up at night. And I was thinking about how in his providence, God not only gave us Sabbath to spend 24 hours away from that stress, but during the week, if you need a five-minute Sabbath where you can forget about that stress and set it aside, God gave us the gift of prayer. He gave us the chance to communicate directly with him, to take those worries and those concerns that we have, even if it's for two minutes during the day, and hand them over to him and take a mini Sabbath at work, take a mini Sabbath on your drive home, on your drive to work. So if, if you're visiting today or if you've been coming here for 20 years and you have something that's weighing on your heart that you want to be prayed for, there should be prayer cards in the pew in front of you. Fill one out. Turn it in to the deacons, the elders, the pastors. As you can see, there are names on the screens of prayer requests that people have submitted. Madison Campus takes your prayer requests very seriously. We pray for them. So please, if you have something that you would like to be prayed for, write it down, turn it in. If not, and you just want to take a break from your stresses, you want to take a small Sabbath during your week, think about that gift that God has given you. In Peter, First Peter, God specifically, paraphrasing here, says, cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. When I think of the Sabbaths I can take throughout the week, the little breaks, I know that there is someone that I can cast my cares on and turn that over to him, and he listens and cares for me. And that in itself is a blessing. As we pray, if you'd like to join me kneeling, standing, sitting, whatever is most comfortable for you, let's pray. Most infinite Father God, thank you for Sabbath. Thank you for the opportunity we have to draw nearer to you, to spend time with you, to leave our worries and our stresses Friday evening and know that you will take care of us. Thank you for the gift of prayer, the chance that we have to communicate directly with you, to take a small Sabbath during the week, whenever it is, and know that we can come to you with our worries, with our cares, and with our concerns, and you will take care of us. Lord, I pray for every name on the screen. I ask that you work in their lives. I pray for each and every person that is here and that is watching. You know the concerns and worries on our hearts, Lord. And I ask that you watch over us and guide us. We love you and thank you for your infinite love. Please come soon. Amen.
Please join me in singing Redeemed. Mm. We always need God, right? Please join me in singing right now. Lord, or, <laughs> Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. The 
the sin runs deep Your grace is more Your grace is found Is where you are Where you are Lord, I am free Holiness Is Christ in me Sing it if you believe it, church songs to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I can't understand I fall on you and Jesus you're my hope and say I have asked uh, Patrick and Don to help me out. By the way, I'd like to introduce to you the newest member of our pastoral team here at Madison Campus Church, Patrick. You might be saying to yourself, Patrick looks a little young. And we would say, no, he's not. He is just the right age that God's called him to be a part of our team here. And what we try to do at the church is to hire a couple students from the academy to serve as student pastors every year. And uh, Patrick is going to be our pastor. I don't think I've told him this, but if he's willing to accept it, he's going to be our pastor past the summer and through the school year. So um, we're really excited about having him on board. He's worked with us this last week, and I can just tell you um, the rest of the pastoral team just loves you, and I like you okay, too. In all seriousness, Patrick, I'm delighted. You are just a wonderful addition to our family. All right, um, what I've asked them to do is help me out. Today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 5. We're start, we've started a series of sermons on the books of Matthew and Luke. What we're doing is we're comparing stories that are in Matthew and stories that are in Luke that are the same. Same story, but maybe told a little bit differently. One of the things that we sometimes tend to do is read stories in isolation. What do I mean by that? I mean, we read the story of the temptations of Jesus, and we read the story from the account of Matthew, and we just kind of go on our way. Or we read it from the viewpoint of Luke, and we kind of go on our way. But I think there's some real value when the, story tells the, same, when the Bible tells the same story more than once, in one, more than one place, there's some real value to taking a moment and stopping and comparing, because what you're going to find is that just like all of us, we approach life from different viewpoints. And what's important to me may not be important to you, and vice versa, and therefore when we read the Gospels, we see a picture a more complete picture. It's like when I used to work in news. I'd tell people, if you really want to get the best news you can, you should not watch just one channel. In fact, you should probably watch the one that irritates you a little bit as well, um, whichever one that happens to be for you. Um, but you should watch a little, and then you'll have a truer picture of what's really happening in the world as opposed to a very slanted view of that. And I think it's the same thing is true when we read the Gospels in the sense that 
we can learn a lot more when we compare and contrast. So that's what we're going to do today. I've asked uh, Patrick and Don to help me out. We're actually going to read through the complete temptations of Jesus as outlined in the book of Matthew, chapter uh, 4, verses 1 through 11, and then Luke 4, uh, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to do the narrating. And I've asked Patrick if he would do the voice of Jesus. So I'll read the, all the parts except for Jesus' part, so you know what that leaves Don, right? <laughs> and he was gracious enough to uh, be voluntold that he would do it, so that, that worked out all right. So uh, I'll go ahead and start reading. And by the way, I tried this first service. I said, why don't you as a congregation read along with me? They didn't do it. I just read by myself. So here's what I'm going to tell you. If you'd like to read along with me, I'd love it. If on the other hand it feels a little awkward to you, you don't have to do it. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. If you have a digital device, you can choose that version. It'll also be up on the screen for you if you'd like to see it there. So if you want to read along as I'm reading, that's fine. The only thing I ask you to do is not speak when the voice of Satan or Jesus is speaking, all right? So here we go. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread, by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. We now turn to Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you, Patrick. I'd invite you as a congregation to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I really don't want the congregation to see me today. I want them to see you. And I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable, so I want them not to be focused on my story or me as much as I want them to see that they're not alone. That Jesus went through these things and we go through these things too. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. The title of the sermon is Into the Wilderness. 
Am I the only person here today who's just a little bit bothered when you read the first verse of Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4? What do I mean by that? I know you're not supposed to be bothered when you read the Bible, right? But I'm going to be honest with you, as I prepared this sermon, it bothered me a little bit. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. He'd just been baptized. Huge religious moment. And then it says, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. That's how Luke puts it. Matthew puts it. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Does that bother anybody else? It bothers me. Maybe I'm just uh, from a younger generation, but it just bugs me the idea that somehow God's Holy Spirit would lead me into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I know we sit there and we say, well, that was Jesus being led into the wilderness. And, and, you know, so that's different. Jesus was perfect. And so, you know, that's all good. Jesus was led by the Spirit. But you know what? As I look through the Bible and look for people connected with the word wilderness, do you know how many people pop up? A lot. Well, there's, there's Hagar and Ishmael. There's Joseph. When his brothers throw him into the pit, it says they threw him into a pit in the wilderness. Do you think that Joseph's life was a little bit of a wilderness experience? Yeah, I'd say so. And and it's not just Joseph. How about Moses? Now, we go, okay, Moses was naughty. He killed somebody he shouldn't have. He had to flee to the wilderness. God had to teach him some things. But what did he do to deserve the children of Israel for another 40 years in the wilderness? How about the children of Israel? They spend 40 years in the wilderness. They go through the waters of the Red Sea. Much like Jesus was baptized in the water and the children of Israel go through the water of the Red Sea. And where did they get led out of the Red Sea? After this amazing victory, this moment where they're, they're dancing and they're singing and praising God for their deliverance. Where do they wind up? In the wilderness. David. David's called from the wilderness. David, Jesse, David's father, says, my son's out in the wilderness tending, tending sheep. And Samuel says, well, go get him. Let's anoint him. And David must have thought, yes, wilderness, check, done, moving on. Instead, he gets anointed, and he doesn't find himself too long after that in the wilderness again, hiding from somebody who's now trying to kill him. Elijah calls down fire from heaven, consumes the the sacrifice, the, 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 the priests of Baal are put to death. It's this incredible victory. It finally rains, it pours. He comes through the rain. And what happens when the rain's done? Jezebel's like, I'm going to get you for this. And where does Elijah head? To the wilderness. What does he say? I wish that you would just kill me already. What have you, what, why, why, what, what's going on? Keep in mind, it's a man who had seen fire come down from heaven 24 hours earlier in the wilderness. Interestingly enough to me, one of the places that I found the wilderness is in Song of Solomon. Do you realize that Solomon's lover comes out of the wilderness? Maybe that connects to Revelation where the woman goes into the wilderness And Jesus' lover comes out of the wilderness to him. Well, I don't need to tell you about John the Baptist. He kind of spent his entire life in the wilderness until he upgraded to a prison cell and was beheaded. That was, that's that's him. Paul, when he talks about his persecutions, says that he was in the wilderness suffering. So I look through it and I see a lot of wilderness experiences. And I can, I'll, like I said, I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable here with you for a minute. I have preached more than one sermon to you about how God led my wife and I and my daughter and my uh, son who was, Rochelle was carrying at that time. We led us out of Guam with no job and how God provided a job after that and how he led us and how we in faith moved out when we heard God tell us to do that and how we trusted him to take care of us. And it was really the hardest thing. And so, you know, about six or eight months ago, I thought, you know what, it's time to write a book. You know, that's what 
I'm probably supposed to be doing at this point in life. I've got my master's degree, probably ought to write a book or something. What should I write a book about? Well, I should tell the story of just how I know how to follow God's call in my life and do what he asked me to do and follow him no matter what, no how or how hard. I can, I can give some pointers out on that. I do, I've done a lot of sermons on it. I can write a book about this. This will be good. And so I did. I started writing. And I've got to tell you, I'm a, I've, got a, I've got a lot more book to write because as soon as I started, I started telling this story because I was like, you know, the first story in the book is about how the guy confronted me at my going away party um, on the island and said, oh, do you have a job? And I said, I don't have a job. And he said, well, you know, Ken, things don't always work out. And, and my, my premise was it always works out. God always works it out. And, um, and so God, God said, okay, Ken, time for another wilderness. And what became really obvious to myself and Rochelle was that, that Rochelle's been working as a teacher and the job has been too much given all the other things that we have going on in our lives. Rochelle gets no Sabbath. You know, she works Monday through Friday and then she becomes a pastor's wife on Saturday and Sunday and then she goes back and does it again. There's no Sabbath there for her. There's no rest. And I remember her telling me one night, she said, I just don't know that I can keep this up. I don't know that I can keep this pace. And I was like, oh, we need the money. And I remember her looking at me, and she was just, it was, it was you know, it was one of those dramatic moments with husbands and wives, right? And she said, okay. And I remember thinking about it over that weekend. I remember saying to myself, if it wasn't for the money, what would you tell her? And it just hit me in the eyes. I would say, absolutely quit your job now. This is killing you. And so I prayed about it, and I went to her and I said, you know what? We've trusted God before. He's come through for us before. It always works out. I'm getting ready to write a book about that. And so Rochelle turned in her notice with no job. But we know that God works things out, right? This was back at the end of February. Both of us felt God say to us, Rochelle's not going to get a job until the last minute. And we just got her last paycheck yesterday. She doesn't have a job. Wilderness. You think you trust God. And then he shows you what's really in here. My tears tell you that I don't trust him quite as much as I thought I did. Because if, if I really trusted him, I'd be up here, it's going to be great. But there's a part of Ken that's worried. Now, I'll tell you, Rochelle's done two interviews this week, and they both look great. Look like they could probably work out. But I don't know as I preach this sermon to you. And so when I read that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, I don't particularly like those verses. It's not right. It's not fair. Why would you do that? I don't need a wilderness. I need just, you can do this easier ways. Thank you very much. But that's what the Bible says. Not just in this story, but over and over and over again, that God leads his children into wildernesses. Places where the resources are scarce, the food is not sure, the water is gone, it's hot, it's dusty, and you feel all alone and desolate. And if it's any comfort to you, the Spirit of God led Jesus there too. I want to get nerdy with you for a minute, okay? Can you hang on for a minute with me? I want to go through a couple details of this story that I would like you to hang with me for. I think they're fascinating. 
because I like this kind of stuff. If you don't, pretend like you do. All right, here we go. Did you notice as you read these stories that Matthew tells a different order of temptations than Luke does? Matthew says stones, pinnacle of temple, mountaintop. The temptation is turn the stones to bread. Jump off the pinnacle of the temple and God will save you. Kneel down before me and I'll give you all the nations of the world on top of this mountain. However, Luke tells it in a different order. He starts off, again, just the way that that, uh, Matthew does with uh, turning the stones into bread. But then he moves to the top of a mountain, which with the devil saying, hey, bow down before me. And then finally, he stops, the story concludes it with Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple, rebuffing Satan there. So let me ask you a question, why? And now I'll give you the answer, no one knows for sure. But I want to point out a couple things to you that are really interesting to me about this story. And, the re- and was I look at why these two authors put the, the, them in different orders. Firstly, I want to suggest to you that Adventist theologians believe that Matthew's is the probably the correct order, that it was the order that it probably happened. If you look it up in the Adventist Bible commentary, you'll see that they say that. There's many reasons for that. I'll give you a couple. Like I said, we're going to get nerdy for a second. In the original language that's written in. Matthew uses chronological language to tell the story. He says, and Jesus, and the devil said to him, take this. But, and then after that, he says, then the devil did this. And then for the third temptation, he says, again, the devil. So he uses chronological language. Whereas Luke, on the other hand, uses the word and. So the devil, and the devil said, turn the stones into bread. And the devil said this. So he's not using, chrono, Luke doesn't use chronological in a language. In other words, to his reader, he's sending the message, the order's not what, what's important to me. What's important to me is that you understand that I've ordered them in a way that I'm trying to make a point for you. I'm trying to make a point for you on this. So pay attention to the point. It's, and, and one of the things we have to understand, we, as Westerners, we have a real hard time getting this through our, de- our thick skulls, but in our culture, we're very chronological. This happened, then that happened, then that happened. Don't mess up the order, because if you do, you're lying. Ancient minds did not have that problem. Ancient minds were more like pastors. All my stories are true or could have been. <laughs> and the point is not the story. This point is not the story. It's the point I'm trying to make by telling you this story, and sometimes the order that I put it in helps me make the point I'm trying to make, okay? So ancients didn't have a problem. They weren't being dishonest when they did it. It was just that the order wasn't that important to them. So when Matthew and Luke do a different order, neither one of them looked at the other and went, liar, fake news. They said, oh, we get what you're trying to say. Okay. Um, So here's the deal. This is, to me, a fascinating point. When Jesus... The final temptation in Matthew, where does it end? On top of a mountain, right? If you flip to Matthew 28, look at the last verse in Matthew 28. Where does the story end in Matthew 28? On a mountain. It ends on a mountain. Here's what I want you to think about. The temptation that Jesus had on top of that mountain was bow down to me and I'll give you the whole world. And Matthew makes the point, and I think it's very intentional, he makes the point when Jesus is resurrected, comes back to life, and then ascends to his father to claim this world as his own, redeemed by his blood, he goes up on a mountain. He, he is tempted to take the shortcut, but he doesn't. He does it the hard way, the way God's asking him to do, and in the end, he is victorious on top of a mountain. Doing it the way that God said to do it, not the way the devil tempted him to do it. Now, if you take a look at the book of Luke, Luke's story ends where? On top of the temple, right? Pinnacle of the temple, jump off. And if you jump off, the Bible says that God's given angels to gear you up so you won't even stub your toe. Now, let me ask you, where, if you flip to the end of the book of Luke, where does the story end there? You're going to say, well, Jesus ascends into heaven, and then what happens? Anybody take a quick look and see. 
The disciples go into the temple to proclaim the good news that the Messiah has come and fulfilled prophecy. In other words, Luke ends his story of the temptations on top of the temple saying, Jesus, jump off and prove to all these people that are gathered around here that you're the Messiah. And then Luke says, but the right way to do it is that Jesus' disciples are going to say, look, this is the Messiah raised from the dead in the temple, spreading the good news, God's way, not man's way, not the easy way, not the way that Satan tempts, but the way that God had called him to do it. Isn't that neat how the two of them use those devices to show us a point that they want to make? You know, another reason Adventists happen to like the the Matthew chronology is because if you read The Desire of Ages, written by Ellen White, who we believe is a prophet, she puts the order of the temptations the same way in the two chapters that she writes about them. The temptation is one chapter, the victory is the second chapter. She she puts them in the same chronological order as Matthew does. However, what's interesting, again, I'm nerdy, page 116 in uh, Desire of Ages, she actually writes the chronology the way that Luke does it. So she tells the story the way Matthew does, but then she writes this sentence. With the terrible weight of sins of the world upon him, Christ withstood the test upon appetite, stones, upon the love of the world, bow down before me and worship me, and upon the love of display which leads to presumption, presumption, jumping off the top of that temple without God asking him to do it. And Mrs. White actually, so she tells the story Matthew's way, but then she, when she presents them, she does it in Luke's way. So that to me is another little interesting facet. Like I said, it's a little bit nerdy and maybe you don't see any value to it, but I love it, okay? And so I get to preach, I get to do what I want. All right. Um, let's take a look at these temptations. Um, in The Desire of Ages, Ellen White talks about how these temptations are, are a a great representation of our first Adam, Adam in the Garden of Eden, versus the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Whereas Adam and Eve fail the test in the garden, there's, there's fruit, there's, there's food there, appetite. There, there's the, you won't die, just, just go ahead and do what you want to do. And then there's that, well, God's trying to hide something from you. And that's what Jesus is presented with. He's basically saying, there's a lot of easier way to get this done. All you have to do is bow down. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to go through all that suffering. All you have to do is bow. It's a really quick way to get around this, okay? Whereas Adam and Eve fail, Jesus overcomes. And keep in mind how amazing that is. Adam and Eve were not in a wilderness. They were in the Garden of Eden. Beautiful garden. They're perfection. They have a character that leans to doing what's right. They don't have all the physical effects of sin throughout the centuries and millennia. And they fail. Whereas Jesus, with all the the, the scars that come from bad DNA, from parents who are not the greatest. Oh, Mary and Joseph weren't the greatest? Well, they did lose him, okay? Okay. And then they blamed him for it. So I'm just saying, good parents, but not perfect. Jesus, as we mentioned last week when we talked about the genealogies, he had some people in his background that, uh, questionable characters. Given all that, Jesus overcomes. In a wilderness, he overcomes. But I want you to also recognize something else about this story. It's not just Adam and Eve that this story points at. It's also the children of Israel. Remember I mentioned they came through the Red Sea. They walked through the waters. Jesus had just been baptized when he went out into the wilderness. The children of Israel walked through the Red Sea. They go into the wilderness. Each one of Jesus' responses to the devil, and we, you know, most Christian kids know that Jesus used scripture to defeat the devil, right? We've probably heard that a lot. Um, Each one of those scriptures, though, is from the book of Deuteronomy, and it addresses a way that the children of Israel fell short in the wilderness. For instance, let's take the first temptation that both Luke and Matthew put as first. The temptation to turn the the stones into bread. 
Jesus' response is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'd like to read you the whole context of what he said. I'll give special emphasis with my voice to the part that Jesus actually said, but then I'm going to run and read the whole context of it. Deuteronomy chapter 6. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. What's the first thing that the children of Israel do when they get in the wilderness? Oh, we're going to die. We're hungry. We're hungry. What does God do? He provides manna for them. He provides what they need. Not them providing what they need. He provides what they need in his way, in his time. And Jesus is tempted the same way. Jesus had the ability to turn a stone into a piece of bread. He could have done it. He was hungry. He was really hungry. I'd be hungry after 40 days of fasting. I'm hungry after a day. But Jesus was never to use his powers to serve himself because that's who God is. He doesn't serve himself. He serves everyone. So it was not his job to take care of himself. When God wanted him to have bread, God would provide bread. He didn't need to do it himself. What are you trying to do yourself today? What bread are you trying to create out of stones? When God says, I've got something better, it's called manna. What about the temptation on top of the mountain? Jesus answers from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 14, is the context of it. And again, I'll emphasize with my voice when we get to the part that Jesus actually said. This is where Jesus is tempted to bow down before the devil, and the devil will give him the, the, the land. This is what Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 14 says. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build. Did you catch that? Great and splendid cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, and vineyards and olive gardens which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied, then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You are not to follow the gods, any gods of the people around you. You catch that? There's a lot of us that think we've provided for ourselves. We think I work hard, I go to work, I do a lot of hard things, and I am a provider. And we worship something other than the God that created us. We create the gods that we have created. You're in charge money. You're in charge food. You're in charge of my wants, my needs, my desires, and I will shortcut whatever I have to do to not have to experience pain. Can we be honest? We live in a society that does not want to experience pain. I don't, and if you do, I think you're being dishonest with me. We live in a very, 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 in a time when people are very, very focused on the avoidance of pain. Many, many years ago, it used to be that people kind of accepted pain as inevitable, but with the advent of wonderful health care, the advent of the internet, we are able more and more to insulate ourselves from pain, and that's why our pews become empty, because when we come to church, we experience pain, because there are other people around here who aren't nice. You're one of them, and I'm one of them, and what happens is we rub on each other, we say, I don't want to experience that kind of pain, and so we avoid what God wants to do in our lives for the shortcut of not experiencing the pain of coming into fellowship with one another. I've done it. There are times I still do it. Finally, the temple temptation. Again, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy. By the way, you do remember... I I guess I failed to say the mountain temptation. What happens when the children of Israel get into the promised land? They do exactly what they weren't supposed to. Yep. I mean, I didn't do this, but let's settle down and chill out. We don't need to conquer the rest of the land. That's for chumps. We've got a good place to live. They didn't finish the job, which is probably, by the way, Matthew puts that one last. Because with Matthew, that would be the progression of the sins of Israel. Temple and temptation. Deuteronomy 6, verses 16 through 19. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Remember, Jesus quotes this to the devil when he says, jump off the pinnacle of the temple. What was Satan trying to do? Well, the temple, if you think about it, 
and I'm not suggesting it, but you know, if you go to a very, very um, well-populated place where there's a lot of people and you jump off of a building, please don't, there's going to be a lot of people that watch it. And if you survive, if you walk away without even stubbing your toe, you have just hit celebrity status. You will go viral. Um, kids, you won't be able to do that, so don't. Please don't. But the point is, Satan is trying to make Jesus jump from the top of the temple where there's tons of people and prove his sonship, his authority, his messiahship to those people down there. So he's essentially saying, if you jump off of here, they've got it. they're going to think you're famous. They're going to think you're, going to, you're going to become famous and they'll accept you for who you say that you are. Do it. But where is Massa? Well, in Exodus, we find out that Moses names a place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel because they tested the Lord. How did they test the Lord? Basically, there was no water there. And they said this, is the Lord among us or not? In other words, when there wasn't water, they're like, okay, God, if you're really God, provide some water. You prove that you're God by doing this. And Jesus' answer is, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Mass, so you should diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he commanded you. You shall do what is right and good in sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers by driving out all your enemies before you as the Lord has spoken. This is the context for what Jesus quotes there. Jesus is saying to them, look, God doesn't have to prove himself to you. Things don't have to work out the way that you think they have to work out for God to still be real and still be there. And when the water doesn't show up, that's not your problem. That's something that's God's problem. That's easy to say when you have had plenty to drink this morning, but it's another thing when you're dying of thirst. So those are some of the things that we see going on in this story as we look at it. And I want to ask you as we, as we wrap this up, are you in a wilderness today? You know, Christian preachers across denominations are fond of saying, if you're not in a wilderness today, you're probably going into one, and if you're in one, you're probably coming out of one only to go into another one. And the reason they say that is because it's true. How do we know this? Well, look at the end of the way that Luke ends his. Then the devil had, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him, until an opportune time. He didn't say, well, congratulations, Jesus, you passed the test, no more need to check anything else out, you check out, good for you. No, he just said, well, so long for now, I'll be back. He's absolutely relentless. But let's not forget how Matthew ends his story. The devil quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus when he says, jump off because the the angels will catch you. And how how does Matthew end the story? Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Those angels of Psalm 91 showed up. In his emaciated state, those angels showed up and took care of him, restored him, But it was in God's way and time, not in Jesus' way and time. What do I want you to take away from today? The first thing I want you to realize is that after every spiritual high, you should not be surprised when you hit a low. You should not be surprised when you get led into the wilderness. Now, the temptation is to see the wilderness as a very bad and negative place, but I wonder if we could reframe it a little bit. I wonder if when God takes us into the wilderness, it's not as bad as we think. In fact, it might be a good thing. I wonder if when God takes us into the wilderness, when he strips us of all the luxuries and all the things that we count on so much, it forces us to look at him in ways that we don't look at him otherwise. I wonder if when we are suffering and we are hurting and we don't understand, I wonder if those are the times that we have the opportunity to connect to God in ways that we never would connect if things weren't stressful and hard and tough. So I wonder if the wilderness isn't a blessing 
rather than a curse. I wonder if when the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, he used those 40 days in the wilderness to fast and to pray and to connect with his Father rather than being, oh, I'm in a wilderness. That's Ken's, by the way. That's what Ken did. Oh, I'm in a wilderness. That's me. Jesus uses the time productively. He prays, he fasts, he spends time connecting with his father, and then when the devil does show up, he's ready. So I want you to reevaluate wildernesses. Maybe it's not such a bad thing going into those wildernesses. Maybe it is a time where our relationship with Jesus grows and deepens and becomes more fervent if we allow it to rather than allowing it to push us away from him. I want you to also recognize the temptations that that Satan throws at us. Church family, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he died so you could be better. We often like to talk about the justification aspect of salvation. Justification means how we're made right with God. We sing things like Jesus paid it all because he did. And we ignore the fact that God wants to sanctify us, the sanctification part. What does sanctify mean? It means the making holy, making like him. You see, God loves you as you are. He's purchased you, but he would sure love for you to be happier. He would love for you to trust him more. He would love for those negative character, characteristics that you have, the anger that wells up quickly, the biting words to a spouse or child. He would love to go ahead and work on those things if you would just let him. God didn't want you to be more than what you are. And why would we blame God for that? Like that's some sort of bad thing. We all send our kids to school and they might not think it's a great thing, but we send them there because we want them to be better than they could be otherwise. And anybody who's endured school knows it's not always fun. It's tough, it's rough, it's hard. But at the end, you gain knowledge. You gain the wisdom that you need for the careers and things that you want to do in your life. And why do we get mad at God for saying, I would like you to be a little bit more than a kindergartner? The temptations that come our way often are in the form of our appetites. We hear it a lot in our society. Well, I know that God says that we're not supposed to do that, but I just feel like that's the way I was created to be. And we confuse the way that we are created with the way God wants and desires us to be. Do we want to turn over our appetites for food, for the things? That's a hard one for me. I like my candy. Do we want to turn those things over to God? Do we want to turn over to God our sexuality? Oh, no, 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 God, that's not yours. That's mine. You created me that way. You you created me to cheat on my spouse, so it's not my fault. You create... Well, we'll go ahead and not go get ourselves in too much trouble. Church family, your sexuality belongs to God. And the question is, what does he want to do with that? Those are our appetites. What about our need for affirmation outside of God? Jesus, jump off the temple. All these people recognize you as being awesome. How many of you get your self-worth from what people say about you rather than what God thinks about you? I do. I really like it when you walk up to me after the sermon, you're like, oh, that's the best sermon ever. Can I just be honest? I do. Is it good for me? Probably not. Don't stop. Um, (laughs) heading for a wilderness all right Um, church family if God says that that we are enough we're enough it doesn't matter what Abner thinks of me if I know I'm doing what God's asked me to do I have no need to get your, your stamp of approval on it although it's nice Where's your worth found? Is it in in your relationship with God or somewhere else? 
And that final major category of temptation that comes our way is to be in control of our own life. In other words, to be our own God. Say, I'm the God of my life. I'm in charge of me. Thank you very much. I'll do what I want to do. And God, you bless what I want to do. So you're, you're not really going to be my God. You're going to be more of my genie. So when I want something, I'll rub the lamp and say, hey, God, your will is for me to be this. Do it. Church family, that was Adam and Eve's big problem, wasn't it? I'm the God of me. I'll do what I want. I can be like God. The fact of the matter is we do a pretty poor job when we try to be like God, don't we? We create things like the Holocaust and starvation and AIDS and all kinds of things when we go ahead and do things our own way. The fact of the matter is, is that when we let God be in charge, a beautiful new world can open up. So how did Jesus conquer? I promise I'm wrapping it up. He conquered it because he had a deep understanding of the Bible, the scriptures, and the context of the Bible. We often like to focus that Jesus overcame the devil by the scriptures. No, he didn't overcome the devil by the scriptures. He overcame the devil because he understood the scriptures. There's a difference. The Pharisees could recite the entire Old Testament, and they nailed Jesus to the cross. So knowing the Bible does not save you. Knowing how to apply the Bible, knowing how to apply the Bible, that makes a big difference. And yet, let's not forget what happened. Jesus was led by the Spirit through the wilderness. You see, knowing the Scriptures is great, but if you do not have God's Holy Spirit living in you to show you what those Scriptures mean and to guide you in what that means, it's pointless. You will misuse the scriptures. You'll beat other people over the head with it. You'll apply it to other people. You'll never apply it to yourself. It'll just be about you and pushing other people away. However, when you have the Holy Spirit leading your life, you'll notice a lot more of the imperfections in you and a lot less of what's going on around you. If we're led by the Spirit, we have nothing to fear as long as we rely on the Spirit. It's important for us to put the scriptures in our minds so that the Holy Spirit can bring them back to our mind. We have to do that. But if you don't have the Spirit, you've missed it. You've missed it. Not by might, nor by power, nor simply by memorization of scripture, I added that. But by my power, says, the, says God. Church family, if you're in a wilderness today, like I find myself in, if you're in a place where you feel tempted by Satan to not rely on God, if you find yourself in a place where you want to trust yourself, I urge you to look at Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, who turned away Satan at every turn, that didn't take the easy way out, that endured the pain lay before him that he might enjoy the splendors of heaven later. Church family, let's turn our eyes to Jesus. Let's understand that Satan is conquerable, not by our power, but by the power of God's Spirit in us. If you have a wilderness today that you're trying to struggle your way through, I want to invite you to stand where you are, and I want to pray a special prayer for you. If you have a wilderness that you said, man, Pastor Ken, I'm right there right now, I just want to invite you to stand where you are for the closing prayer so I can pray specifically for you. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as I look around this congregation, I see people standing up. I don't know each one's individual situation. For some people, it may be finances. For others, it may be marriage. For others, it may be uh, bitterness, anger, hurt, horrible things that have been done in their life to them. And as they struggle through this wilderness, Lord, I pray that it would push them towards you. That they would spend more time praying. That they would spend more time in communion with you, fasting, spending that time that they need to connect with you. May they not allow that wilderness to break them, but rather may they, may they let that wilderness make them into the child of yours that you want them to be. I pray that you would make every single person who stood up victorious over the temptations of the devil, not by their strength or by their power, their intellect, or by the fact that they were smart when they were seven years old and memorized a lot of memory verses, but by the fact that they are allowing your Holy Spirit to lead them now, that they are putting your scripture into their hearts so they will not sin against you. Lord, may each person who's standing be victorious. 
and may they recognize that there is going to come a day when this will be done. The wilderness will be over, and the Garden of Eden will be restored. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory. We pray in your name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, I want to let you know that there is a picnic lunch at, f- at 6 o'clock this evening out at uh, Percy Warner Park. It's part of our Imagine Nashville initiative. It's really cool. All the Adventist churches in Nashville, whether they're South Central or uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, are coming out for that. Great fellowship time. Hope to see you there. There's also a visitor's potluck immediately following this. God bless you. Have a great Sabbath. <laughs>